So welcome, everyone. Uh, this panel has been titled Murray's Children. And you can see from looking, some of us have enough gray hair that we don't look like children, though we may act like children a lot of the time. But uh, all of us have been influenced by Murray in, in such a way that we consider ourselves intellectually and spiritually uh, to be Murray's children. Uh, and we're going to speak briefly about some of our experiences uh, with Murray. My name is Peter Klein. I'm a professor of business at Baylor University. I'm going to moderate the panel. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce the other panelists now uh, to save time. Each of the panelists will have five minutes to offer some prepared remarks. And uh, I, I don't follow Walter Block's philosophy in all areas, but I do follow his philosophy of timekeeping, which means strict and pushy. Uh, <laughs> So in alphabetical order, we have uh, Joanne Cavallo. She's a professor of Italian and chair of the Italian department at Columbia University here in New York. Uh, Tom DiLorenzo is professor of economics at Loyola College in Baltimore and a senior fellow of the Mises Institute. Jeff Herbener is professor of economics at Grove City College and a senior fellow of the Mises Institute. Uh, Yuri Maltsev is professor of economics at Carthage College and also senior fellow of the Mises Institute. Uh, Roberto Madongo is Associate Professor of History and Political Thought at the University of Roma III. Uh, Sandy Klein is Adjunct Professor of Economics at Baylor University and Director of the Mises Academy's online learning platform. And Mark Thornton is a Senior Fellow uh, at the Mises Institute. So, uh, Joanne, you are first. Okay, so thank you, Peter. Hi, everyone. I'm really thrilled and honored to be here. I probably don't merit inclusion in this illustrious group, but I'm happy to share the story of my encounter with uh, Rothbard's work. It all started with watching the 2012 Republican primary debates with my son on TV. And so yes. Standing. Oh, I can stand. Oh, sure. Okay. Should I start again? It all so it all started with watching the 2012 Republican primary debates on TV with my son and being blown away by Ron Paul. So at the time, I was completing a work on the Italian Renaissance Romance epic, in which I couldn't concentrate. I was very distracted. I kept going to uh, the internet to see anything that was Ron Paul related, and I came upon this piece, and it was called "I Hate Ron Paul." by a fellow named Walter Block. I didn't know who he was. And I thought, this must be a hit piece. So I clicked on it all indignant. I was ready to be enraged. And then it started out, before the Paul campaign of 2012, I was a reasonably productive researcher and writer. Nowadays, all that has changed. I have become a Ron Paul junkie. I thought, OK. <laughs> There's, <laughs> there's a kindred spirit, and I suppressed the urge to contact him right away, but um, soon after, I came across another article of his on libertarianism and the environment, so I gave in and I uh, sent him an email. He responded immediately, inviting me to join him in a panel called Literature and Liberty at the upcoming Austrian Scholars Conference at the Mises Institute, and he wanted an answer right away, right? <laughs> So I asked my two kids if they thought I should go to this conference in Alabama, and they said, no, <laughs> we should all go. And in fact, uh, I, we were heading then to Auburn uh, for their spring break, a 15-hour drive from our New Jersey home, and I wanted something that would keep us occupied on the trip, but also could be a jump start into Austrian economics. And Joe Salerno had mentioned in an email that 2012 was the semi-centennial of Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State. So I bought the audiobook, and there's the culprit, Walter Block, I just walked in. I've already talked about you, so you can't sue me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And so uh, it turned out the trip turned out to be a Rothbard marathon with time preference, value scales, the emergence of money, the law of marginal utility, all with such brilliance and clarity that non-specialists like us could understand. So miles flew by as we were first stranded on a desert island with Robinson Crusoe picking berries and then exchanging with Jackson and then moving on to a more uh, complex economy at work. And there was just one point when 
uh, Jeff Rickenbach was reading a very long chart with many, many horses and many, many barrels of fish that my daughter fell asleep. So I thought the thing about counting sheep really does work, but it was a, sh <laughs> it was, it was a short nap. And for most of the ride, we were, my children were listening along with me and stopping the CD every once in a while to, to ask questions or to comment. So I guess you could say Rothbard accompanied us on our first trip to the Austrian Scholars uh, Conference where we heard many of the speakers this weekend also presenting papers. And so after a very stimulating uh, and intense three days, it was time for the ride home. And my kids wanted to take turns driving, and I thought maybe I would give them a break from Riggenbach reading Rothbard and read something uh, to them myself. So I started reading a book I had bought at the conference, uh, Lou Rockwell's The Left, the Right, and the State, and it was so compelling that I just kept reading until I was hoarse. And nevertheless, I couldn't resist jumping ahead to the final chapter, We Need an Angel Like Clarence. And uh, Rockwell starts off uh, by saying, Murray Rothbard used to wonder why people who believe that liberty is unachievable or that activism of any sort is futile become libertarian in the first place. And then he goes on to make the point that no state is liberal by nature, said Mises. Every state wants to control all. If it does not do so, the major reason is that freedom-minded intellectuals are making the difference. So at that point, I decided that I wanted to be in that group, even in my own small way. As, as it turned out, the book I was finishing, um, The World Beyond Europe and the Romance Epics of Boyardo and Ariosto, was already anti-statist in its perspective. It just lacked the theoretical apparatus of Austro-libertarianism. So I made it in time to um, insert a couple of small additions in that direction, including a reflection by Rothbard on the medieval wars of Germany and Italy, based on his economic thought before Adam Smith. And since then, in my research, my um, say an article on Machiavelli, on Marco Polo, on Renaissance fiction, in a co-edited volume with Carlo Lottieri entitled The um, Speaking Truth to Power from Medieval to Modern Italy, uh, Austro-Libertarian has been uh, front and center of my work. So to conclude, I see it's time for me to conclude. Yeah, I told you I was a Wachian on this. <laughs> <laughs> what seemed in the beginning to be a distraction from my research ended up being an integral part of it. So if any point, at any point I do merit inclusion as Rothbard's heir, it will be really thanks to Ron, Paul, Walter Block, and Lou Rockwell. So thank you. This thing work? Yeah, it worked. Uh, my, my first uh, communication with Murray Rothbard was a, a letter. But when, uh, when he and Lou founded the, the, uh, the Mises Institute, uh, I, got, I was an assistant professor of economics at George Mason University, and I got a postcard in the mail announcing the creation of the Mises Institute. And by then, uh, you know, I had been through graduate school at, at VPI, this Virginia Polytechnic Institute, which is, was the name of the school before they got a good football team. They became Virginia Tech after, after that. <laughs> but back when there was still an engineering school and they had James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock and the public choice people were in the economics department, it was a you know, scholarship was at least a little bit of a focus there. But anyway, I'd read Human Action uh, in, in graduate school, and so I was already familiar with the Austrians. And uh, even as an undergraduate, uh, I had discovered the Freeman magazine from the Foundation for Economic Education, and for pretty much the four years of my undergraduate, I had read every issue of the Freeman. And I, so I'd run across von Mises and, and, and the other, all of everybody in the, in the movement at the time. But anyway, uh, I get this uh, postcard announcing the, the Mises Institute being created. And so I, I immediately, uh, since I was a wealthy assistant professor of economics, <laughs> I, I sent them a check for 50 bucks and, uh, to buy some pencils and pens or something like that. And, uh, and I got a thank you, nice thank you note, uh, handwritten, as I remember, and uh, it was from Murray. And, uh, and, and so uh, I wrote back, and, I, and, they, and they sent me a Mises tie, on Mises tie. I'm not wearing it today, but, uh, but uh, it's kind of got lost in the shuffle over the years. And, uh, and I said in my letter that I will wear it proudly in the halls of academe, and, and it will have the same effect 
as flashing a Christian cross in front of Dracula. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and Lou tells me that Murray laughed his head off. You didn't, those of us who knew Murray, you could imagine him cackling over uh, a, a silly joke like that. So that was sort of my first communication with Murray Rothbard. Uh, but uh, my, uh, when I went to graduate school, yeah, I'd already known about the Austrians. I'd read some Austrian economics as an undergraduate. And my first semester in uh, microeconomics in, in graduate school, the textbooks were Human Action by Ludwig von Mises and uh, Milton Friedman's Price Theory. And uh, Richard Wagner was the professor. He's an, he's an Austrian. He's now George Mason, been there for many years. And uh, in his syllabus, the very top of the syllabus was a lengthy quotation by Ludwig von Mises on what it means to be an economist. And, and I was so impressed by that. This was my favorite course in the whole curriculum, I think. Even though Wagner was a, kind of a boring lecturer, monotone, I, I just ate it up. It, but it, the substance of what he was saying was so great, I couldn't wait to get to his class. Every other class was pure torture, you know, mathematical, economics, econometrics, and all, all this stuff. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but his class, I couldn't wait to get there, uh, to the class. But anyway, this, I, I don't have the quote in front of me, but it said, uh, essentially, to be, a, to be an economist, in the opinion of Mises, you had to not only just master economic theory, but you should also be educated in philosophy, history, political philosophy, uh, sociology, and, and so forth, to be a real economist. And that, that impressed me a lot because, uh, because I was already becoming very jaundiced about the mainstream and how, 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 uh, how it operated. Uh, one quick example, I can, I can remember a seminar in graduate school. They had a weekly seminar in the economics department and some big shot mathematical economist from Princeton came and had a mathematical model of the hamburger market on the, on the blackboard with a you know, big, big blur of equation after equation after equation. And Gordon Tullock asked him, but this said, but this is nothing at all like the real hamburger market. And his response was, I don't care about the real hamburger market. I care about my model. And, uh, that's, what, that's what I care about. And so I'd already been kind of sick of this thing. And so it was so, how refreshing to see. And then once you start reading human action, after this quote at the beginning of the syllabus, I, you know, I hadn't read a page of it yet. It was the first day of class. Uh, I understood what, what he meant to, to, be, to be a real economist. And then, uh, of course, and I'd known about Rothbard. I'd read uh, uh, Four New Liberty. <laughs> And, uh, and so I started reading more, more of him and in graduate school, and I, and I came to the conclusion that uh, no one uh, fit the bill in terms of that definition of what it takes to be an economist, aside from Mises himself, than Murray Rothbard. And, and those of you who have read Rothbard's works, uh, it's just, uh, you know, one of my, f my favorite Rothbard economic uh, journal article is his uh, critique of utility and welfare economics, where, where he just totally destroys the mainstream uh, view of, of, of welfare economics. And, and when I read that, I said, this, this is a Nobel Prize caliber thinking here that went, in, went into this. And then you read his, his history book, you know, the history of colonial America and the, the, even the Panic of 1819 and history of money and banking in the United States. It's, a, it's almost a perfect description of what Mises was talking about. And, so, and that has influenced uh, my career and my writing and my books. And, and I'm, I'm just like an, an ant compared to the elephant of Murray Rothbard in that regard. But it did give me a, a, a path to follow, and I've tried to do that. Well, growing up in the uh, frontier areas of civilization, I didn't have the advantages that uh, Tom DiLorenzo did. You know, the long arms of even the mail back in those days didn't uh, deliver human action to, uh, you know, prospective uh, economists. And so uh, when I was doing my undergraduate work, uh, in fact, the very first class I had in economics, um, I did have the, I, I was exposed to the kind of uh, what you might consider the central um, uh, insight uh, that Mises, I would learn that Mises had expounded on um, years before in human action. And this was the, the natural order of the market economy that's brought about by the economic calculation, the system of economic calculation and entrepreneurship. So I had a professor who was at least uh, sufficiently aware that they could present this idea to me. This, this idea captured my mind completely. So as soon as I heard that, I, I was an economist. I committed myself to economics. This was a class in microeconomics, and I must admit, uh, it was more or less downhill from there. 
in my, you know, uh, training in the mainstream. So the next semester was macro, and it was a total mess where none of that, uh, you know, that insight uh, didn't exist. And then, uh, so I graduated without hearing any mention of the Austrians or any furthering of this insight and uh, went to grad school where the same thing happened. It got worse, of course, in grad school, as uh, Dr. DiLorenzo has already pointed out, to the, you get down into the minutia, the models, and uh, you know, you, you're, you're not talking about any of the uh, sort of social theory that um, drew me into uh, economics as a, as a life, in, uh, intellectual life. And so I went through all my graduate studies, never heard uh, any mention of the Austrian economists except in a monetary theory class of all places. I had another very well-read and insightful professor who talked about Bumbavork's theory of roundabout production. That was the first time I'd ever heard the name of an Austrian economist. <clears throat> and you know, monetary theory, go figure, that he's talking about that. But um, so afterwards, after I finished my graduate study, of course, I had my um, you know, p particular interests and areas that I had specialized in grad school, monetary theory being one of them. So I knew I was going to do some uh, intellectual work in that field. But I really wanted to rekindle this, uh, this exciting insight that I had, I had uh, been exposed to in uh, undergraduate. And so I began to read uh, on my own. And uh, I started through the Austrian literature. A friend of mine introduced me to uh, laissez-faire books. And uh, by that time, I was uh, uh, not in, on the frontier anymore, and they could mail things to me. And so, you know, I got, so I started with I started with high, you know, flipped through the book, and I'd already been introduced to Friedman, right? But and uh, so I got introduced to Hayek, and then I found that not uh, what I was looking for. Hayek didn't really uh, have like this this uh, he didn't build on this basic social insight. He project was a little bit different than that, but through Hayek, I got introduced finally to Mises. <laughs> and I found out, of course, after reading Human Action, that there's a long tradition of economists who've written what we might call grand social theory, right, that have, um, you know, been, been, uh, it had a basic insight about the natural working of society and how it uh, uh, functions, how the social order functions. And so this, this was great, but I still, there were certain things in Mises that didn't, um, I didn't warm up to, certain other aspects of his thought. But when I, but from Mises, I, I of course, got uh, Rothbard's um, Man, Economy, and State was next. And then, and then, you know, someone, Ron Paul, I think, mentioned earlier today, you know, he, the depth and the clarity of his writing is so uh, convincing, right? Uh, <clears throat> so I uh, became a Rothbardian, uh, just just like that, because he built on, you know, he built a social theory. And then I found out, of course, uh, reading further in Rothbard, that he not only had a social theory that was uh, uh, sprung from his economics, but he extended his foundation of this praxeological foundation of Mises to include other uh, important uh, uh, social sciences, right? The political philosophy and and so on. So here, here it went beyond my expectations that I could just be uh, satisfied in my intellectual life by uh, economics to proceed into political philosophy and the praxeological foundation of all of these uh, social sciences. So that was really uh, the important thing about, uh, about uh, uh, for, for my intellectual life about Mises. Now, do I have like a minute or... 30 seconds. So let me, because I did want to throw in uh, just a, uh, something about the career advancement uh, associating with Murray. Um, Murray, I, I'm not sure exactly how it works out for the rest of the panel, but uh, Murray only helped me in my career on a personal level. And I don't have time to go into the full story, but uh, one time he, it, was, it was with a phone call that was... Uh, uh, timed at just the right moment when someone was in the room with me and I took the call and this person was very impressed. <laughs> a, a, person, a person to whom I reported as, a, as a, an assistant professor. And the other was uh, the importance of the Mises Institute in uh, securing my position at Grove City College. This too was uh, the work of uh, Lou Rockwell and, and, uh, and, and Murray Rothbard. <laughs> and then um, 
The, the final thing that I, I uh, want to uh, point out is the uh, inspiration that Murray has given me just as a person. I think uh, Murray's, Murray was more committed than anybody I know to the life and flourishing of the human race. He, he loved life. He loved to be among people, as we've seen, like Joe Salerno was talking about, real people, right? He loved to live life real, with real people in society. It was a very inspiring thing, so we're very grateful to Murray. You know, we all remember the people who have influenced us the most in, in, in our personal development, in our intellectual development. I've been privileged to know a lot of really smart people in my day. Uh, my father was a professional historian who, like Murray, got a PhD at Columbia in the 1950s. He went on to write several articles and books and was well regarded in his professional field of colonial American history. Uh, my PhD supervisor, Oliver Williamson, is an expert in uh, business economics and industrial organization and was regarded when I studied with him as sort of a Nobel worthy contributor. And indeed, he did go on to win the Nobel Prize in 2009. I took a course from George Akerlof, another eventual Nobel laureate. I worked as an assistant to Christina Romer, who became one of Obama's chief economists. I even know David Gordon. I mean, come on. <laughs> but you know, I've never met anybody like Murray Rothbard, not just in terms of his intellectual capacity, but his energy, his indefatig uh, you know, his undefeatable spirit, uh, the sheer breadth and depth of his interest. You've heard so much in the last day or two about the huge range of topics on which he had interests and expertise, not just intellectual topics, but soap operas and gossip and so forth. Um, Murray seemed to know, you know, not every, not only everyone, but everything. One of his talents that I think is not as appreciated as it could be is his talent as an editor. Uh, Murray was the founding editor, not only of the Review of Austrian Economics, but also of the Journal of Libertarian Studies, uh, which he edited until his death. And uh, in the last few years, uh, in the early 90s, uh, I was fortunate to be his uh, assistant editor, uh, which means I handled manuscripts and helped him assign reviewers and so forth. Uh, now, the JLS was, at that time, an, a, a peer-reviewed academic journal, uh, and most of the articles were peer-reviewed, but it turns out often the peer reviewer was Murray, <laughs> right? Because I could never find anybody to do a peer review who knew more about the subject, no matter what the subject, than Murray. And he would write these incredible letters back to the reviewers. Those of you who have been through... Uh, have, have submitted articles for publication, know what this process is like, but you would submit an article to the JLS on almost any subject, not just technical economic theory, not just philosophy, not just libertarianism, but uh, everything from church history to contemporary politics. And the reviewers, sorry, the authors would get these, you know, 10 page single space letters back, you know, with, with, uh, all sorts of suggestions for things they could read and arguments that they had gotten wrong and, uh, ways that they could improve their papers. I mean, just absolutely incredible. Um, I never went through that process myself, but I can imagine being very depressed. Uh, there's, a great, there's a great story you can find if you Google it by Robert Higgs, the eminent uh, economic historian who received something like a 20-page single-space letter from Murray after he sent Murray a manu manuscript for his book, uh, Crisis in Leviathan. And Bob said he was in utter despair that he could live, you know, 100 lifetimes and never be able to do all of the things that Murray thought should be done to make that a better book. Uh, one of my most formative personal experiences was having a telephone interview with Murray Rothbard before I started my graduate work at Berkeley. And I, I had sent off an application for a Mises Institute fellowship uh, by mail, of course, as you did it back in those days. And I got a nice letter back from the fellowship committee uh, you know, thank you for your application. Your, your grades are satisfactory. We're interested in pursuing uh, this further. The next step will be to have an interview with our academic director. You know, I keep reading in the letter, Murray Rothbard. Uh, I had read Murray's uh, books. Uh, I had, had read some of his books as an undergraduate student. And, uh, but I couldn't imagine, you know, speaking to him in person, sort of like Walter Block said about, you know, uh, trying to talk to Mozart. Um, so I was extremely nervous for this telephone interview, but it actually went really well. 
Um, even though I didn't know much, and I probably thought I knew a lot more than I actually did know, but Murray was very kind, and he was warm. He put me at ease. I can remember uh, uh, telling him about problems I had with my undergraduate economics professors, who were all mainstream mathematical economists, Keynesian macroeconomists, and so forth. In particular, uh, I had had a microeconomics course from this one professor, and I'd gone to that professor and said, well, I need to take my macroeconomics course next semester. Which course should I take or which professor should I sign up for? Could you give me some advice? And that professor had said, oh, I don't do any of that macro stuff. I don't know anything about macro. And I related this story to Murray on the phone. And, you know, Murray believed in the integration of all human knowledge and especially the integration of all fields of economics. And Murray was horrified by this. Oh, how can you not know macro and be an economist? And he went on and on. <laughs> so I knew I was in his good, you know, I was in his good corner at that point. Um, and uh, I, I subsequently became one of the young people who clustered around Murray at conferences uh, at uh, the, what became Mises University. We then called it, I think, uh, Conference on Advanced Austrian Economics in the summer. And, you know, Murray loved to stay up late and talk to the students. I tried not to be as annoying as some of the other students who would, like, literally follow Murray into the bathroom asking him questions about things. I won't mention any names. Because um, you would recognize these names. Uh, one time I, I, I gave Lou Rockwell and Pat Barnett a heart attack uh, because I was tasked to go pick up Murray at his hotel at some event and bring him to the venue and I think it was in California. It wasn't a place where I was living at that time. I didn't know the roads very well. I had some kind of a map, but for you young people, this was the days before GPS. And so of course I got lost on the way back. You know, I'm in the car with Murray and he's talking the whole time and I'm fascinated by what he's saying, but trying to pay attention to the roads and look at the map. And of course I got lost. And they were waiting at the venue. You know, there's several hundred people there waiting to hear Murray Rothbard and there's no Rothbard. And eventually we made it, you know, just sort of at the nick of time. Uh, it's, it's great melodrama. Um, you know, like everybody else, I was, I was completely shocked by his passing in 1995. I can remember hearing about it when I was, uh, Sandy and I were in Washington, D.C. I was interviewing for academic jobs at the American Economic Association meeting. And right at the end of the meeting, we found out. Um, and, uh, you know, I couldn't believe it. But, uh, you know, someone said yesterday, uh, you know, that no person is indispensable to a great movement. I mean, if anyone is indispensable to the modern Austrian economics movement, it's Murray Rothbard. But yet, um, you know, all these years since 1995, the movement in many ways has grown, thanks to Lou, the people who are here. Um, it's a great honor for me to know Murray during the last few years of his life, and I'll always be very proud to be considered one of his intellectual disciples. <laughs> One correction of something Peter said. I was there at the early Mises University when he was a student, and he, he, he did cluster around Murray, but he mostly clustered around Sandy, who is now his wife. <laughs> well, I was actually going to tell a story about that, that um, in May 1992, um, actually on Peter's birthday, on May 1990, in May 1992, I was at a Mises Institute conference, my first one, at Jekyll Island, and um, ended up being a pretty important uh, weekend. I met my husband there, uh, met Joe Salerno, and also I met Murray. And um, the first time that I met Murray, so I was 25 years old, and uh, I grew up in the South. You can already tell I'm a Southerner from my accent already, from just those little few words I've said. I had not been exposed very much to people with this thick New York accent like Murray's. And so our first conversation um, neither one of us understood very much what the other said. Um, he thought my name was Sadie. So um, anyway, what? but anyway, he was so sweet. And a lot of people will um, tell you uh, that new Murray will say that he was so much fun. Uh, of course, brilliant, but so much fun and incredibly sweet. Um, and I was just going to tell uh, one experience that I had with, uh, tell about one little interaction that I had with Murray, that I have uh, a letter from him. I wanted to read a little excerpt of that. So um, when I was in graduate school, I was, and I was in graduate school when I met him, um, I had expressed interest in studying regulation of capital markets. Um, and uh, one of my professors had said that wasn't real, I was going to start writing papers on that in my classes to get ready for my 
uh, writing my dissertation, one of my professors said, you know, I don't remember which class this was, but he suggested, uh, why don't you look at kind of the origins of some of this? And so I mentioned that to Lou, and Lou said, oh, you should definitely contact Murray because Murray would know all about it. And so I uh, typed out a little letter, and this is before the internet, so we faxed this. Remember faxes? We faxed this letter to um, from the Mises Institute to Murray in Las Vegas. And I remember thinking, well, maybe, you know, I was asking him for, uh, tell him this is what I'm interested in, uh, regulation of capital markets, and uh, could you give me maybe some sources where to start uh, to read in this? And he, I, I thought, well, maybe I'll hear back from him in the next month or so. The very next day, I walked in the Mises Institute, and Lou was so excited, came up to me and said, look, you just got this fax back from Murray, and it's really great. And it was, it was three-page, single space on his typewriter, three-page, single space, uh, letter going through um, <clears throat> giving me some really, of course, great sources that I asked for. But it was such a great letter because the first thing he said was uh, he wanted to encourage me in my topic. He said, I think it's a great topic. It's very important because uh, there's if you look at cap, if you look at IO, industrial organization theory, um, in economics today, that's really not in the hands of Austrians at all. And even the best IO economists, like say uh, maybe Chicago School, is that there's zero capital theory in it. They have they have no mention of uh, capital, how the firms got the capital. It's just each firm is assumed to have this homogeneous blob of K. Right, that was their capital theory. No, I, no mention of the important role that financial markets play in determining, you know, which lines of production get the capital and which ones don't. So, um, anyway, uh, he he also gave me the advice he gives to all graduate students. He said, "You're going to get sick of your topic. It just happens. Don't be discouraged. Uh, do not change your topic. If you uh, if you get sick of it." then uh, just keep working, get finished, get the PhD in your hand, then you can rest for a few weeks, then, then you can refocus. But he said, get, the, get your PhD, get it in your hand. So uh, anyway, the rest of the letter, uh, he went on to give me a full rundown of the whole cast of characters uh, responsible for the creation of the SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, uh, and the uh, the letter, uh, it's it's funny because it's really typical Murray's style. Uh, there's a lot of uh, details on evil backroom deals and shadowy and sinister characters, uh, conspirators. And he said even these people, he explains how they were manipulated and backed up by, you know, higher ups. There's even a Supreme Court justice involved in the, all this. And um, he gave me a lot of sources to read and uh, with his own review and comments on how, uh, what he thought about the accuracy of their work. Um, the part I wanted to let, the part of the letter I wanted to read was just kind of gives it a, a flavor for his attention to uh, contributing details of, you know, people's background, their alliances, their relationships that influence them. And um, this is just one of my favorite little nuggets, Murray, from this letter. Uh, it's at the end. He tells me about uh, Ferdinand Pecora. This guy was chief counsel to the Senate Committee on Banking and Currency when they were investigating um, Wall Street banking. And he ended up authoring the Pecora report, which led to uh, Glass the Glass-Steagall Act. So anyway, so this is, I'm going to quote this. Ferdinand Pecora himself was a nasty piece of work, a highly politically ambitious Italian-American immigrant consumed with hatred and envy of wasp Wall Streeters. He resigned from the SEC to become a New York judge because he thought it was corporate he thought its corporatism wasn't socialistic and anti-business enough. He was also the strange anom that he was also the strange anomaly of being an Episcopalian from Sicily. How many <laughs> he says how many Sicilian Episcopalians can there be? <laughs> he says, but even the feisty Pecora only went after Morgan Wall Streeters and one semi Rockefeller bank. So um, anyway, then he he said uh, uh, he concludes the letter with saying, "I hope this was helpful." So good luck. So anyway, Murray was I mean Murray was great. He's just so sweet and helpful. So that's.
right. Well, <clears throat> meeting Murray definitely was one good, very good reason to defect from anywhere to anywhere. And, uh, especially from Russia. Yeah, it's a good place to be from. And uh, besides that, I not only got kind of uh, a deal by one get one free, I met, I met Murray. I was extremely sweet and lovable person, and I met all his children, my brothers and sisters at this table and beyond. And, uh, and that was really kind of, a, a, I would say, intellectual holiday for me to come from this. The Soviet Union was not bleak and gray, and just by visually it was, but also mentally. I mean, that's, and this is, was such a festival of free thought of everything. I met Murray in 1990 in Stanford University at the Mises Institute we had, and uh, he was extremely, extremely lovable. He was playing piano, he was singing, he was, he was, he was one of the nicest persons for me to, uh, to, uh, to be introduced to, to, to American intellectual of, of, of great, of the great quality. And, um, and then the uh, Soviet Union began to unravel. As Murray would say, you probably was the last bucket that this, this evil empire kind of turned over uh, because I defected. And, uh, and so <laughs> he couldn't stand that anymore. And so it was definitely it was something too big to fail. It was Soviet Union. It was the biggest thing in the world, 11 time zones and whatnot. And I was thinking at that time, as Soviet government introduced something called 500-day plan. And I remember with Murray, we were discussing quite often uh, how this transition from, from socialist slavery, how this transition to freedom can occur. And, and I remember it was Murray and Alex Tabarok was with us also. And, and uh, we kind of all came to the conclusion that it can happen only in, 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 in one fell swoop. That you cannot have, you cannot, as Murray said, you cannot just cut the, 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 the tail of a dog one inch at a time. And uh, it, it would be painful. And so, and, and I, and so I, I decided to write, a, to, write a, to write a response to this 500-day plan, which is, uh, which the title was self-descriptive, Maltsev One-Day Plan. One-Day Plan. And, <laughs> And Murray was helping me to intellectually to discuss these issues, and he would say, privatize everything, privatize everything, bureaus to bureaucrats, typewriters to bureaucrats, flags to communist park officials, just privatize everything. And so we were kind of, uh, uh, he also was, um, was at that time, he wrote quite a lot about privatization, about transition in, in many countries. He, we had, uh, if you maybe remember, we had 11 people from Lithuania, 11 people from it's it's very interesting story because I befriended in Washington DC when I lived and worked for federal government well it was an overstatement of, of what I did <laughs> <laughs> I don't think many people did that but and um, uh, but uh, at that time I befriended um, uh, Gottfried Habler uh, Gottfried Habler is a great great Austrian economist he was part of Mrs seminars in Vienna uh, but then he became some kind of a sellout because he was teaching uh, um, almost Keynesian economics in Harvard. And uh, Murray was very, I would say, very uh, critical of him. Uh, but then I told him that I met uh, Gottfried and I am visiting him every Saturday. He had this nice Viennese, uh, Viennese tea and parties and whatnot. And Murray was it just, what a sweet person he was. He said, let us bring him back. Let us bring Gottfried back to the Austrian school. And, um, and he said, let's invite him and, um, uh, to one of the conferences. I said, he probably would not be movable. And he said, okay, let's do a conference in DC. So we had a conference in, in Washington DC uh, from all places on socialization, on desocialization, how to desocialize. And, um, and Gottfried came there with a walker and made a, made a, made a great speech about von Mises, and, um, and Murray was just so happy. Um, then Murray was on a personal level. He was, he was the sweetest person I've, almost, I've ever met. He would invite me to UNLV, uh, where he was teaching, three times as a visiting professor, just to pay me money. And I said, what should I say? He <laughs> said, say whatever you wish to. And I said, I had a fantastic time in UNLV, because Hans Hoppe, he would drink beer with students every night. And <laughs> I happily joined that crowd. And uh, during the day, we had um, a lot of discussions with Murray. And Murray and Joey, they brought me to, to the, at that time, there was no strip. Uh, there was uh, just the downtown uh, Las, Las Vegas. And can you imagine, you walk in downtown, then the, the, the light comes 
out of the sidewalk. And people look very weird, and all of us look very, oh, sorry about that. <laughs> and, uh, and so that was just a fantastic thing. I thought that this is a, this is a kind of a 23rd century thing. And then Mary would, uh, would, all the time, would push me to do some academic work, serious academic work. He didn't, I was not as lucky as Bob Higgs. I didn't receive 20 letter, 20 pages letter from him, but I received 18 pages letter from him <laughs> about history of economic thought in Russia. And he, <laughs> and he, yes, and he knew so much about, for example, Ukrainian economist of the 17th century, Sir Georgi Skovorada. I just, I never heard of him and never, <laughs> so, and well, before I, before I shut up, I, I, I want to tell you that when, when Mary died, I was really so saddened, I was missing him, I was almost crying, and I came for a memorial service here to New York, and, um, and Joey, she invited me, she invited Ralph Rako, she invited Ron Hamovi, and invited me for a, for a dinner. And, um, and I was so sad. And, and she was, however, laughing like I don't know whom. And she was laughing and laughing and laughing and saying, can you imagine you go to an eye doctor, you go to an eye you sit in a waiting in a wait room, you know how he died. Yeah, he, he went to change his glass prescriptions. And, um, and she was saying, what is SOB? What was he showing him? He got so excited and died. <laughs> <laughs> this, this tables, yeah, tables. And she said, can you imagine you go to the eye doctor and corpses are coming out. <laughs> and she said the only, the only really sad thing that Murray couldn't get, couldn't get the last great laugh about it. <laughs> and I think that that's, that's true. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, the story of my own experience, uh, my Italian road to Rothbard, uh, the story of how I met uh, uh, Rothbard's work for the first time. Uh, in 1995, when I was uh, a very young scholar, I received a fellowship uh, by the Italian National Research Committee. Uh, to make research at Princeton University. Uh, the topic of my research was uh, very politically correct because uh, I had to make research on uh, the American feminist movement uh, of the 19th century. Uh, at that time, uh, I was already familiar with Mises and the Austrian school, and I knew that Mises migrated to the US so when I arrived to Princeton, I had an idea in mind. I wanted to find the American scholars who attended the Mises Seminar at New York University. And I had a title, the title of a book with me. The book was uh, Austrian Economics in America, The Migration of an Idea by Karen Vaughan. So I found the book in the Firestone Library at Princeton University, and I found the name of Murray Rothbard. I was totally fascinated by his ideas, and I spent all the summer of 1995 reading Rothbard's books in the Firestone Library. Uh, when I came back to Rome, instead of writing a book on the American feminist movement, I wrote a book on Rothbard. Uh, which was uh, the first uh, book uh, uh, on Rothbard in Italy. My professor was really very, very angry with me. <laughs> uh, she was a feminist, uh, she was a leftist, and, uh, and so she was really very, very angry with me. I was a young scholar, so for a career reason, I had to make research also from a gender perspective, to write works uh, from a gender perspective. Uh, but I continued to write articles and books on Rothbard. And she complained because I had a double life, a secret life. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I didn't give up. Uh, she tried to hamper my career in every horrible way, uh, but I didn't give up. And uh, I was young and time uh, was on my side. Uh, so... <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, my professor retired, most of the old fashioned professor retired, some of them even died. Uh, and so um, I took uh, uh, my professor's position at uh, the University of Rome. <laughs> And now I am a well-respected, well-regarded Rothbardian scholar. Uh, my office uh, at the uh, University of Rome once was the office of my professor. And I replaced all her feminist decoration with uh, libertarian and Rothbardian images. <laughs> Unfortunately, I couldn't, uh, uh, I couldn't meet Rothbard personally because uh, when I was uh, in Princeton in 1995, I even went uh, to uh, New York University hoping to meet him. But uh, Professor Mario Rizzo told me that unfortunately, uh, Murray uh, was, has just pa um, passed away during the winter. So I couldn't, uh, I couldn't meet him personally. But... Uh, I, I was lucky enough to uh, correspond uh, with uh, Joy, with uh, Joy Rothbard, uh, who was uh, very, very sweet to me, and she encouraged my, my work. And so I have a, a very sweet, uh, I remember her in a very sweet way. Uh, so I have to, to, to say, I have to tell you that Rothbard influenced my life uh, and totally changed my life and my career and my intellectual uh, life and my, my intellectual life. So I'm very grateful uh, to Rothbard and to Joy. I'm grateful to the Mises Institute for many things, uh, but the thing I'm most grateful for was the chance to meet, to work with, to learn from, and to hear lectures from Murray Rothbard. Um, in graduate school at Auburn, I was the assistant academic coordinator, um, and of course Murray was the vice president for academic affairs, so I would sort of carry out at Auburn what Murray had decided with Lou. We had student club and seminars and brown bag lunches and all sorts of things. And so it was great working with him um, as an administrator. And of course, he helped me with my dissertation. He helped me with uh, other subsequent research on other topics. Uh, so he really um, was very formative uh, for me. And one of the things that I repeat to students, uh, I'll say here today, because I think it's important for Austrians and libertarians, Murray always said that he was a pessimist in the short run, and then he would throw a couple jokes onto that part, but he was an optimist in the long run, and he said you'd go insane if you didn't have optimism uh, for the future, but being disgruntled uh, in the present for the short run. In college, I learned that I was a libertarian. I learned I had an interest in Austrian economics, but this was in the Stone Age, and it was very difficult to access anything. And I was trying very hard, uh, and I managed to accumulate three books. Uh, one of them was a used copy of Murray's Power and Market, and I read that thing backwards and forwards. Uh, thinking that this is a great work. I had Kersner's uh, book on entrepreneurship and a couple of others. I had Roger Garrison's little pamphlet uh, with the graphic graphical analysis. And so I had seen Kersner. I'd met, met Ralph Rako. Um, I met Roger Garrison. And so I figured I'd already met half of all the Austrians at this point, but I hadn't met Murray. Uh, but I maintained that interest in Austrian economics, and I decided to go to graduate school. And so I went to Auburn, which is where Roger Garrison was. And there I quickly knew from the other professors that they weren't 
necessarily happy about Austrian economics. One of them told me that it, Austrian economics doesn't exist. It's just something from history, but there's none of it around anymore. There's no PhD economist working at a PhD granting institution. So the 12 Austrian economists that are still living are going to die out eventually. So that was my, the thing I learned in my first year uh, at Auburn in the economics department. And then towards the end of the spring term, um, Roger Garrison called me into his office and he said, sit down. And he said, uh, Lou Rockwell is going to bring the Mises Institute to Auburn University. And, you know, Roger was kind of a prankster. You know, he would tell people things. He would tell other people different things. And he was always fond of putting the graduate students on. And so he said, Rockwell is bringing the Mises Institute to Auburn. They're going to bring all the great Austrian economists to come in to lecture. They're going to publish books. They're going to publish newsletters. And I said, Roger, that can't be right. That just can't be right. And so to somehow prove this, he went over and there was this giant box and it had, um, it was filled with copies of Man, Economy, and State. And he gave me one. I said, Rothbard, I've got one of his already. And, uh, but that's the first I had ever known of man, economy, and state. And little did I know that power and market was intended to be part of man, economy, and state. And so he gave me the book, and then he said, and they're going to uh, pay for your education. And at that point, I was in complete disbelief that this could possibly be happening to someone from New York who went to Alabama and then all of a sudden, Lou Rockwell and the Mises Institute show up. So it was, um, it was amazing uh, transformation. And I've worked under Lou and with Murray to a certain extent for more than 10 years as a graduate student and as a professor uh, there at Auburn University. And uh, he was an uh, inspiration because uh, not only was he optimistic, but he believed in having a good time. Uh, he was just such a great source of knowledge and inspiration um, that his death really was very difficult to take. Um, I was uh, afraid that we would, the Austrian school, all the progress we made uh, would be for want. And, and also, I was, I was physically ill and sick and depressed as a result of that whole experience. But what I've learned since then is that Rothbard spirit lives on, that his children have done very well, and we all look forward to the future with you. Thank you.